Okay, time is up. Please hand your quizzes in towards the end of each row. I'll put it as I walk up. Time is up. Find the room and take another ten minutes. Okay, folks. Here's um, here's what's going to happen. I uh, I will start grading the quizzes as soon as I can. Which is basically a. I'll start grading probably around five o'clock today because I have classes through 4.45 and I'll grade until I'm done, which will be sooner than you think. So I will send an email out saying the quizzes are done when they're ready to be picked up and they will be left on the ninth floor right at the entry of the finance department. There's a, there's a, there's a table with three shelves. Two of the shelves are already taken with evaluation quizzes. I'll use the third shelf for this quiz and they'll be face down in alphabetical order. That's why I asked you to write your name on the back because that way there will be an alphabetical order going, you know, just take your quiz. And the solutions will come with the grading template with the email I send you. I'm still trying to figure out the best way for you if, you, if I've made a mistake on the quiz and I will to bring it to my attention, probably the best thing to do is if you see a mistake on the grading, take a picture of the page. Because you're not still, we're still in this, in this gray zone of people coming into offices and checking. Take a picture of the page, say this looks like you missed something and I'll fix your grade. Any questions before we start? Okay. So we were talking about, oh, incidentally, the most common question I was asked in the last 30 minutes was whether I wanted an unlevered or a levered beta as the answer to problem 3A. And I didn't mean to be brusque, but the answer was actually in the problem, right? Because what did the problem start with? If the company has no debt. So when you have no debt, don't go through the mechanics of levering the beta, putting in a zero, multiplying by one minus the tax rate, and then you're gonna get the same answer. It's just, you know. So the second problem I had to give you a tax rate because you did bring in debt into the calculation 
But when you have no debt, your levered and your unlevered beta are going to be the same number. So with that structure, let's go back to where we were talking about getting the beta for not just Disney as a company, but each of its businesses. And we came with the value of each business, took a weighted average and said, that is the beta for Disney as a company. I want to use that same process to estimate the bottom up beta for my other publicly traded companies. Let's start easy. Let's do the publicly traded companies. Because as we'll see, the private company is going to be a bit of a nightmare. So first I'm going to estimate a levered beta for Vale. And if you look at the breakdown of businesses, there are four businesses, metals and mining, iron ore, fertilizers, and logistics. Again, I took this breakdown from Vale's own annual reports. I'm not making this up. They've given me my, their estimated revenues in each of the businesses. I came up with the unlevered betas for each of the four businesses. Remember for Disney, I tried to stay domestic US companies. That's an advantage you have when you have a market with 7,500 companies listed. As you go to most other markets, in fact, I can't think of a single other market, perhaps China, which has enough companies that you can stay domestic. In most markets, if you stay domestic, you'll have a problem, which is you will not get enough companies in your sample. So here I use global companies for all of them. And intuitively, here's what I'm saying. Vale might be a Brazilian company, but it's actually a global mining company competing with other global companies. Might as well look at betas across global companies. Notice my sample sizes. When you go global with 46,000 publicly traded companies, you're going to find 50, 70, 80, 100, 500 companies in some groups. There's my unlevered beta for each business. I'm going to repeat the process I use for Disney. I've got the unlevered beta for each of the four businesses. I need weights. I don't want to use revenue weights because the margins are different in each business. So what I do is I take my revenues, scale them up. Scale them up based on what multiple of revenues companies in that business trade for. If you're having a aha moment about the quiz, just let it go, right? I mean, because I did give you EV to sales and you might've used revenue weights. It's not the end of the world. But if you can get estimated values, those should be the weights. And based on my estimated values, so basically take the revenues, multiply by the EV to sales, I get an estimated value. The weights I have for my four businesses, about 76% iron ore, about 17% metals and mining, 5% fertilizers, and a tiny slice of logistics. I've got an unlevered beta for each of the four businesses and an unlevered beta for the company based on the weighted average. Then I applied debt to equity ratios. I thought about doing what I did for Disney. Remember I allocated debt across the businesses. In this case, I didn't even try, partly because these are all big infrastructure businesses. They all use debt. Unlike Disney, we have the movie business and the theme park business, very different businesses. Here it looked like allocating the debt might be an exercise in futurity. So I used the same debt to equity ratio. The levered beta, gives me a cost of equity. And you can see as with Disney, the costs of equity are different for the different businesses, but the differences are far smaller. If you are Vale and using one cost of equity across the company, you probably can get away with it, not because you're doing the right thing, but because your businesses are close enough in terms of risk that applying one cost of equity is not fatal. So I have a cost of equity for Vale as a company by taking the weighted average of those four. So my cost of equity in US dollar terms and everything's being done in US dollars because it's a commodity company. Most commodity companies report their financials in US dollars. Why go looking for trouble by trying to convert things into local currencies? I don't know what Luke Oil reports its revenues in. That'd be an interesting exercise right now is to take a Russian company, a commodity company and say, what would the beta look like for that company? It's not the beta that's gone through the roof. It's a country risk premium because you're getting your oil from Russia and that's going to be a source of additional risk. If you get a chance, uh, I, or I'll send it to you, the sovereign CDS spread for Russia started this month, but two weeks ago was around 2%. You know what it is right now? It's about 10% plus. So what happened? Well, you haven't been reading the news. You asked what happened. Both Russia and Ukraine have seen the risk premiums explode which should be a reminder of a country risk can change in a hurry. And using a sovereign CDS spread 
is going to give you a much more instantaneous readout of what's happening in the market right now. The ratings agencies are actually moving faster than they usually do. They lowered Russia's sovereign rating by two notches, which for a ratings agency is like jumping across a cliff. But they can never keep up with the market because things are moving too fast. So I have a cost of equity for Vale in US dollars. But let's say Vale's management says, look, we want to do everything in Rias. We've decided to do everything in the local currency. I'm going to give you a quick and dirty way in which you can convert Vale's dollar cost of equity into a nominal RIAI cost of equity. And you can probably help me out here. What do we say was the primary difference of moving from one currency to another? Inflation differences, right? It's not that country risk goes away. So moving from dollars to RIAI doesn't make country risk change. It doesn't make the business risk change. It doesn't change your debt ratio. It's inflation. So here's the quick and dirty adjustment. My dollar cost of equity is 11.23%. Let's assume I can estimate the expected inflation in Brazil and the US. Let's say the inflation rate in Brazil is 9% and the inflation rate in the US is 2%. If you're in a hurry, just take the difference, 7% added to the 11.23, you will get a nominal REI cost of equity. It's actually, a, if you ever have to work across currencies, it's a neat trick to have in your back pocket because you might be doing things in dollars and the person across the table says, look, I can't deal with dollar numbers. Can you tell me what will be in rupiah or pesos or rupees? Just take the inflation difference and you can convert a cost of capital in one currency into any other currency. In fact, if I wanted a real cost of equity for Vali, you know what I mean? A real, not a REI, but a real cost of equity. Can somebody tell me how I can get a real cost of equity? Give me the quick and dirty correction. 11.23% is my US dollar cost of equity. If I, if I wanted a real cost of equity, what would I use? I would have to subtract out inflation. Which inflation? Though? The US dollar inflation rate, 2%. 11.23 minus 2% gives me a 9.23% real cost of equity. Now, of course, I could have done everything from scratch, right? I could have gone back to risk-free rate and reis and worked up. But why waste your time? Why not just take the inflation difference and move from currency to one currency to another? Now let's talk about estimating the bottom of betas. My two other publicly traded companies. One is Tata Motors. It's in the automobile business. Initially, I considered breaking it down into two sub businesses, mass market automobile and luxury automobiles. See why? discretionary versus non-discretionary, you'd expect. I very quickly gave up. It's, it was very difficult to draw the line. So I took the beta for automobile companies globally, 0.8786, and applied this to Tata Motors. Again, I'm not staying with Indian automobile companies, too few companies, and really Tata Motors is not comparable to them. I'm using the beta across all automobile companies globally. Take the unlevered beta, apply Tata Motors tax rate, 32.45%, Tata Motors debt to equity ratio, levered beta 1.10. That then becomes the basis for my cost of equity for Tata Motors. Risk-free rate is an Indian rupees. Remember how we got that? We took the government bond rate, netted out the default spread. And you're gonna see now why I netted out the default spread because in my risk premium, I'm including the countries that Tata Motors is exposed to. India is one of them, but China is a big chunk of its revenues as well. That's all in my equity risk premium. My cost of equity in rupees is 14.49%. Any questions on? So again, I'm going global to get a much larger sample. And intuitively, I think Tata Motors is a global automobile company rather than an Indian automobile company. Finally, for Baidu, I looked at 42 companies that derive their revenue primarily from online advertising. So you're going to see companies like Google in there. Alibaba was in there. And if you look at those 42 companies, the unlevered beta is 1.30. You take the 1.30, use the tax rate for Baidu and the debt to equity ratio for Baidu. So by now you can see the unlevered beta comes from the business you're in, but your tax rate and your debt to equity ratio drive your levered beta. Cost of equity in Remimbi, 
Risk-free rate is 3.5%. Again, that's a government bond rate in China, net of the default spread, plus beta times equity risk premium, cost of equity of 12.91%. If you did not net out the default spread from the government bond, you're double counting country risk. You see why? Because your government bond rate is going to be higher. Why? There's default risk, and then you're using a higher risk premium. We net out the default spread to prevent the double counting. And finally, I have Deutsche. Now, how do we get betas for all the companies so far? We got an unlevered beta. Then we levered the beta up using a debt to equity ratio. So to do all of that, you need a debt to equity ratio. You're saying, what's the big deal? Debt to a manufacturing company is a source of capital. Debt to a bank is raw material. You know what I mean by raw material? You borrow money at 4%, you lend it out at 5%, you make money on the spread. In fact, finding out how much debt a bank owes is an exercise in frustration. Try it out. Take JP Morgan and say, how much debt does JP Morgan have? You will give up after a while because everything could be debt and nothing could be debt. So I'm going to save you the trouble. If you're working with banks and insurance companies, which none of you should have, that's the reason I pushed you away from them. But if you were, you can skip a step. You know what the step is? You know how we got the levered beta for the sector, unlevered and then relevered? I'm not going to unlever and relever because I don't know what the debt to equity ratio is. So it's saying, how are we going to get betas? We're going to make an assumption, and that assumption can sometimes get into trouble, which is all banks have roughly the same debt to equity ratios. Why? Because they're covered by regulatory capital requirements that specify how much equity they need to have. Of course, the problem there is there are undercapitalized banks and overcapitalized banks. I'm treating them all the same, at least my initial calculation. And I broke Deutsche into two financial service businesses, banking and investment banking. Why? Because investment banking is riskier than traditional banking at its core. I got their, your, their, their revenues in 2012. And if they don't have revenues, if they have assets, if, if basically what they've broken the businesses down by. And I took a weighted average of the levered betas of the companies in each business. So is everybody clear on the step, the, skip, the step I'm skipping? I didn't unlever and relever back up. I just took the levered betas and took the weighted average. Yes? You know, I'll give you a simpler way. Maybe we can get betas by capital reserve, by capital ratios. Like that's what I've increasingly started doing is breaking banks down by how much, tier, because tier one capital is public information. You look at the tier one capital ratios, intuitively I'd expect overcapitalized banks to have lower cost of equity than undercapitalized banks. So there are layers you can use here where you can take the tier one capital ratio, which is on S&P capital IQ, and look for banks with similar tier one capital ratios. Because I agree with you, using one beta for all banks can sometimes get you into trouble, especially because we know some banks are riskier than others. Yes. Yeah. I think increasingly, Europe and the US have no problem going across because the regulations are pretty similar. If you go to some emerging markets, a question you might have is, is the regular regulation of these banks similar? There you might say, I'm gonna use only emerging market banks. But you gotta make your compromise. If you say, I'm gonna use only Indonesian banks, you might not have enough. But you could use Southeast Asian banks that are enough in that sample. So there's an argument we made, but this is a case where you don't want to go global because of the type of business you're in. So for Deutsche, I have two different betas, one for commercial banking, one for investment banking, very different cost of equity. Remember what we said last session at the very end of the session? If you use one cost of equity for the entire bank, you have two businesses, right? Which of these businesses is going to overinvest and which one's going to underinvest. You know what I mean by overinvesting? You're being subsidized. Your cost of equity is lower than it should be. You're overinvesting. You're taking projects you shouldn't have. Investment banking is going to overinvest. And if I let this game play out long enough, guess what's going to happen? My commercial banking business is going to die. This is exactly what happened at Bankers Trust in the 1980s. 
It started, Bank of Strauss in 1980 was a traditional bank with a little bit of investment banking. They let this game play out for the next nine years. And by the time you got to the end of the 80s, Bank of Strauss was mostly investment bank because the commercial banks could not compete with that. You're saying, what's wrong? Because for nine years, you've now taken bad investments that were subsidized because you had a nice, safe business. Now it's gone. Your subsidy is gone. You're going to wake up one day and say, what the heck have we done? So those are my publicly traded companies. Those were my easy cases. Remember I have six business bookscape that privately owned bookstore in New York City. If the only way you can get beta is, is from a regression and you have to value a private company or a division of a public company, you're stuck, right? There's no regression beta that I can get for bookscape. Now there are two ways in which I can get a beta for a private business. <laughs> One way I never use, but I'll describe it to you anyway. And the other is the way that I take what I do for public companies and adapt it to private businesses. The way that I don't usually do, even though it's mechanically doable, is even though you can't get past stock prices for private businesses, you can get past accounting earnings. So let's say I have five years of earnings for my private company. Even on a quarterly basis, I have 20 quarters of earnings. I can run a regression of the changes in earnings in my private company against changes in earnings for the S&P 500. It looks like a regression beta, but instead of using stock price changes, I'm using accounting earnings changes. I made a confession, I never do this. Why? What's so problematic about, these are called accounting betas. What's so problematic about accounting betas? Even if they're not distorted, what do accountants tell you up front? They smooth things out, right? That's the nature of accounting. When you have a big loss, rather than take it all, they'll spread it out over five years. So one thing accountants already tell you, and it's not being deceptive, they say, my job is to normalize earnings. So accounting earnings are smoothed out. So even if you're a risky company, I'm not getting the quarter to quarter changes I'd like to see. The second is a purely statistical problem, which is for a regression, I need observations, right? Stock prices I can observe every week, every month, every day. Accounting earnings for most private companies, I observe once a year, not even once a quarter, but once a year. I'm stuck now because if you have a private company that's been around 10 years, I have 10 observations in my regression. And even if the earnings are true, they, they actually measure your true earnings, that's not enough of a sample to get a regression beta. So I'm gonna give you the other way of estimating betas for private businesses. And I'll give you a little bit of a history of how I ended up with this bookscape as part of my book. This was about 20 plus years ago, sitting in my office, this lady barges in, she opens the door and walks in. She says, uh, I own a private, and first she says, I, I heard you teach finance. I said, I teach marketing. I don't want to evade the questions that were coming. She said, no, no, I know you need to teach finance. She said, I own this bookstore in the city. And she gave me the name of the bookstore. And I love bookstores. And I said, I come into your bookstore all the time. She said, I'm facing a fight or flee decision. And I said, are you sure you should be talking to me? This sounds like something you should bring up with the FBI or you know, maybe the mafia is after you. She said, no, 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 that kind, not that kind of fight or flee, but a new Barnes and Noble is opening down the street from me. And I, this is like, you know, when Harry met Sally, right? It's playing through my head. And she says, now I'm facing a choice of either fleeing, which is selling my lease back. No, I have this nice long-term lease, which my grandfather got 50 years ago, that's still there. But the lessor will buy me out for a couple of million. That's the flee. Or I can fight, which is, to take my remaining savings and put it back into the bookstore, building a cappuccino bar and whatever else you need to compete with Barnes and Noble. And I said, I don't, still don't see how I can help you. She said, I need to know what kind of return I need to make on my savings to see if this is a good decision. She never used the words, what was, what was she asking me? What's my cost of equity? What do I need to make on that investment? And your first reaction might be, how the heck have you run a business for 70 years 
which is how long the bookstore had been open without ever addressing it. You'd be surprised how many private businesses don't have any sense of it because their big decision was made 30, 40, 50 years ago. They're essentially living off legacy decisions. She said, can you help me? And I must've been in a good mood. I said, I, I think I can. She, and she gave me a kind of a coupon, I think for $200, the bookstore, and I took it. And I said, I'll call you back. So my task is laid out for me, right? She's in the book retail business. I need a beta. So initially I used the approach that I use for public companies, go find publicly traded book retail companies. And, in this, and when I got that list, I knew this wasn't going to work. There were like three. This is the updated version, but there were three or four book retailers. Remember the two, two ways you get, get around this problem, right? When you're desperate, one is you go global, which in 99 would not have worked for me because I didn't have global companies, or you go up and down the food chain. Up and down the food chain from the book retailers is publishing companies. I was able to find about six or seven more publishing companies. My sample size was like 10, but I wasn't going to try too hard. It's a $200 book coupon. How much more work are you going to put? But 10 is enough, right? Sufficient. So I got the, these are all public companies. I got the betas. I got, I did exactly what I did for this. Got a median beta. And that was the unlevered beta for being in the book business. What do I need to get? That's the next step. When I did Disney, after I got the unleavened beta, I need a debt to equity ratio, right? But the debt and equity we said have to be market values. You see the problem I'm going to run into next? It's a private business. So I called the lady and said, do you have a target debt to equity ratio? She said, a what? I kind of answered my question. I hung up the phone. In most private business, you're not going to get an answer to this question. It's not something owners think about constantly. It would be nice if she said, I have no debt. But that wasn't the answer. So what I did was I used the debt to equity ratio of other publicly traded book companies. With private businesses, that might be one option, even though you don't have a debt. To, never use the book debt to equity from a private company. It's completely meaningless. That debt to equity ratio was 21.41%. I used the marginal tax rate for the owner, 40% then, to come up with a levered bait of 0.86. Plug it in, you get a cost of equity of 7.5%. I almost called this lady and said, your cost of equity is 7.5%. When I paused and took a look at that calculation, what am I doing? I'm taking risk free rate, bait and risk premium. But when you use beta, what are you implicitly assuming? That investors are diversified and that this is an investment you're making as part of a portfolio which I knew was not true for this lady, because what did she say? I'm gonna take my remaining savings and put in the business. She was gonna be the complete opposite of a diversified investor. She was gonna have her entire wealth tied up in this company. So I'm gonna ask you an intuitive question. I know lots of people who take the CAPM, which is what we've used for the public companies, use them for private companies to get costs of equity for private companies. And many of these private companies are owned by people and not diversified. If I use the CAPM to estimate the cost of equity for a private business and the owner is not diversified, am I gonna underestimate that person's cost of equity or overestimate? I'm gonna underestimate, right? You see the, the, the reason. I'm missing all that other risk, which for a diversified investor goes away, but for this lady, that risk is relevant. So I started thinking about how do you bring into the cost of equity for a private company all that risk you cannot diversify away? And I'll give you the trick I've used for 30 years. Some people don't like it. You can take it or leave it. But I went back to my publicly traded company regressions. Remember in that regression, I got a beta, but I also got an R squared. Remember how we characterize the R squared? It's a proportion of risk in this company that comes from the market. I got that R squared for all of my publicly traded companies. There's the R squared right there. The average R squared, take the median R squared was about 26%. 26% of the variation in a book business is, in a book business comes from the market. The remaining 74% is company specific. 
Now this is a little bit of a statistical artifact here, but betas are standard deviation measures. This is the proportion of risk in the variance. So the R squared measures the proportion of variance that comes from the market. What's the square root of the R squared? I know it's kind of simplistic. It's the R, right? It's the correlation coefficient. So what I did was I took my beta, which told me how much of the risk came from the market and said, you know, if you take the square root of the R squared, it's about 51%. So for a typical book company, 51% of the risk in the stock comes from the market, 49%. So think of it as 50-50. If I were a diversified investor, I care only about the 50% that is market risk. But since this person was not diversified, I essentially doubled the beta divided by. So you can already see, you can do this in sector after sector. You'll have a market beta, which is what a diversified investor will see. And I'm gonna call this a total beta because I'm capturing total risk. Not surprisingly, I get a much higher beta and a much higher cost of equity. That was the number I called and gave this lady. I said, your cost of equity is about 12%. And I took her through the process and she, she kind of got the intuition. And then she asked me two questions, one of which was easy to answer and I gave the answer. And the other, I knew the answer, but I couldn't think of a kind way of giving the answer. Her first question was, Barnes and Nobles opening one block away from me. They're a publicly traded company. What's their cost of equity? What's the answer to that question? About seven and a half percent, right? Because their investors are diversified. They can look at only the risk that you cannot diversify away. I said, it's about seven and a half percent. And then she asked me the second question. And this is the tough one, because I know the answer, but I don't know how to give her the answer. She said, if my cost of equity is about 12% and their cost of equity is seven and a half percent, we're both in the same business. How the heck am I going to compete with them in the long term. What's your honest answer to that question? You cannot, you're climbing a mountain. And you know how this plays out? In businesses like this, publicly traded companies will push out private businesses, not because the private business is not efficient, not well run, in fact, it's probably more efficient and better run than the public company, but because the owners, are not taking on risk in an efficient way. 30 years ago, if you walked into a pharmacy in the US, the owner of the pharmacy was usually behind the counter. 85% of the pharmacies in the US were owned by the pharmacist. Today, you walk into any pharmacy in New York City, take a look at the, the, the sign above. It's gonna say Duane Reed, it's gonna say CVS. The pharmacy business is now increasingly publicly traded. 20 years ago, you went to see a doctor. The doctor usually had a private practice, right? In the last decade, a significant percentage of private practices have become part of these chains which are publicly traded. It's inexorable. I know we all have this attachment to mom and pop operations. We want them to succeed. But the reality is to own a private business you have to find something that overcomes that, that disadvantage. And it has to be something that's a niche that allows you to survive. There's a mystery bookstore, I know where it is. It's 23rd Street or somewhere, I'll, I'll find the address. And, I mean, I remember, I haven't been there in a long time. I don't even know whether it survived COVID. But I remember I used to go in and the owner of the bookstore would sit behind the counter. She'd read every single book in the bookstore. So you could go up to her and say, I like uh, you know, this book by Karen Slaughter. And she said, have you read these five other authors? Because they're just like, so think of this as pre-Amazon, Amazon, right? Amazon now gives you suggestions on what to read. She'd read every book. Try that at Barnes and Noble, walk up to the cashier and say, I like this book. Can you suggest other books like it? She says, I never read. So you either find a niche where you essentially say, look, a public company cannot deliver the service. Or you have a legacy investment that's, that protects you. About uh, 10 years ago, they had these auctions. I, I don't know whether they still have them, where MBAs bid for things. And I don't have much to auction off. So I, 
I said, look, I'll value a business if you, if you, if you have a business and you can bid on it. So somebody went and they emailed me and said, I'm going to come in with the details of my company and can you help me value them? And I said, sure, expecting the small business and financials. He walks in with this, you know, this, uh, a, a documents running hundreds of pages and start looking at it. And turns out the company makes rum in Florida. You know, the company was Bacardi. The guy was one of the heirs of the Bacardi fortune. You want, it's still privately run. He's saying, why? Maybe you drink enough of your own product. You forget about diversifiable risks, non-diversifiable risks, you stop caring. But I'm saying when you see companies survive as private companies, it's good to take a look at what allows them to survive because the reality is you're giving up value, staying a private business. You gain control. Sometimes that might be enough to compensate for the value lost. But being undiversified is always a problem. So what I'd like you to do, now that the quiz is behind you, is go back to your project. You've got to take company, work to a bottom-up beta, work to a cost of equity. Try to, try to come up with, so if you have a private, I don't know whether any of you are doing private businesses, but if you have a private business, think about what your cost of equity will be as a private business. In fact, take your public company and say, look, if I took this company private, what would its cost of equity look like the minute I took it private? It's a good exercise in understanding what exactly you're trying to capture in your cost of equity. So all of this talk to get to a cost of equity, right? Public, private. But remember, there's another way in which you can raise money, which is to borrow money. So what I'd like to at least start the conversation on is what is debt? You say, you're saying that's absurd. I know what debt is. It's right there on the balance sheet. I'm going to argue that it's not that simple. I'm going to start with that. And then I'm going to say, what's the cost of debt? Which again, you might say, I know what it is. I can see what I borrowed money at. Again, it's not that simple. So let's start with that first question of what is debt. And I'm going to give you the three characteristics I look for to categorize something as debt. And then I'm gonna ask you questions about items you see on a balance sheet. Say, will that pass as debt? Will that pass as debt? You ready? Here are the three characteristics I look for to classify something as debt. First, debt gives rise to contractual commitments. Contractual commitments. So you can't say, look, I don't feel like paying. I didn't do this that well this year. It's contractual commitments. Second, those contractual payments that you make are usually tax deductible across much of the world, perhaps not in the Middle East, but much of the rest of the world. Contractual claims, tax deductible. And here's the third thing that makes debt debt. If you fail to make a contractual payment, bad things happen to you as a borrower. Like what? Maybe your knees get broken if you borrowed from the wrong guy. But if you're a company, the bad thing usually is you go bankrupt, you're pushed into default, you have to give up control of your company. Contractual commitments, tax deductible, loss of control. So you ready? I'm going to throw items that you see on a balance sheet at you. And you tell me whether you treat them as dead or not based on this definition. Corporate bonds. Easy, that's an obvious debt, right? Contractual commitment, tax deductible. If you fail to make payments, you go bankrupt. Long-term bank loans. Of course, right? How about short-term bank loans? I've never understood why bankers divide debt into long-term debt and short-term debt. What are you telling me? If I take a short-term loan, I can go to the bank and say, I'm going to pay it as a short-term loan. All interest-bearing debt should be in debt. But here's where it gets interesting. Are there things that are not on the balance sheet that meet these requirements that you should be treating as debt? Until 2019, there used to be one item that showed up in company after company that did not get treated as that. You know what I'm talking about? If you're a retailer or a restaurant, what are the contractual commitments that accountants did not use to treat as that? I mean, remember retailers, capital leases they did treat as that, but they divided leases into capital leases and operating leases. They had this silly game of how they categorize and never quite understood something to do with do you actually own the asset or not. But 90% of leases were operating leases. 
and operating leases were not treated as that. So if you have a gap, you sign a 10-year lease agreement for the mall. Is it a contractual commitment? Absolutely. Is it tax deductible? Yes, because you can take those lease payments and deduct them. And what happens if you fail to make those lease commitments? Initially, you lose that store in that mall, but if you fail on a bunch of them, which happened at Caldor and Bradley's, two discount retailers, the company goes bankrupt. This has always been true. I've never understood why accounting had such a tough time understanding why this was there, or at least grappling with how to make it that. Finally, in 2019, they came to their senses. So today, if you look at a company's balance sheet, you'll see both interest-bearing debt and leases, but you need to stop there. You're saying, what else is on the liability side? That is, what about accounts payable and supply of credit? Do they meet the requirements for debt? They're contractual, right? You got to make those. The problem is they're not interest bearing. There's not at least no explicit interest. You know what I mean by explicit though, right? There's an implicit cost you bear when you supply a credit. Usually suppliers, if they're not, if they're reasonably smart, are gonna say, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. But if you pay me now, I'll give you a 3% discount. So here's my deal for people who want to kind of accounts payable and supply a credit as debt. I say, okay, I'm willing to do that as long as you're willing to tell me what discounts I lost by using that credit. And I'm going to treat that as interest expenses. And then they very quickly backtrack and say, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to count supply a credit and accounts payable as debt. Not because I don't owe the money. I know I owe the money, but because the interest payments on that debt are not explicit. So with that structure, let's talk about the cost of debt. In about half of the cost of capital calculations I see in practice, you know how analysts compute the cost of debt? They take the interest expense on the income statement, they divide by the book value of debt. It's called a book interest rate. Never, ever, 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 ever call that the cost of debt if you're computing the cost of capital for a company. Was I clear enough of that? Never, ever, ever, ever. I don't think I've left any escape route there. You think, why not? Because it reflects the rate at which you borrowed money at two years ago, five years ago. It reflects the choices you made about short-term versus long-term debt, right? Because you borrow a lot of short-term debt, your rates are usually lower because you've got an upward sloping term structure. So let's lay out what the cost of debt should be in a cost of capital calculation. The cost of debt in a cost of capital calculation has to be the rate at which you borrow money long-term today. Let me repeat that again. It's not the rate you borrowed money at two years ago, five years ago, rate at which you can borrow money long-term today. I've just made your life simpler, even though it doesn't sound like it, because to get the cost of debt then for your company, you need two ingredients. You need a risk-free rate. And let's face it, if you're doing the cost of debt after the cost of equity, the risk-free rate you've already estimated, whatever currency you're working with. And on top of that, you need a credit or a default spread. Banks, as long as they've been around, have struggled with how do we come up with that spread. They look at their history, they look at their financials. So the big challenge for the cost of debt is coming up with that credit spread. So I'm gonna start easy and work to the more difficult scenarios. So let's say you look at your company and say, how the heck am I gonna estimate the default spread for the company? For about a third of you, the answer might be staring you in the face. There's somebody else whose job it is to assess credit risk for you, and they make public what they think about your company's credit risk, right? What am I talking about? I'm talking about bond ratings, Moody's, S&P, rate your company. I know we're trusting ratings agencies, and you might not want to do that. But think of the trouble it saves you. Your company's triple B rated. I can go to Bloomberg and look up the typical spread for a triple B rated bond. Or a double. In fact, I'll send you a source so you can look it up yourself, even if you don't have access to Bloomberg. So if I have a rating for your company, I can get a, a default spread based on that rating. In fact, if you have a rating for your company and your bonds are outstanding and those bonds are traded, you might have an interest rate on the bond, yield to maturity in the bond. And some people use that as a cost of debt, but I don't, and there's a simple reason for that. Can a risky company issue a safe bond. Let me repeat that again. Can you have a risky company issue a safe bond? <laughs> Basically, you take your safest assets, 
and you borrow against them, right? So when I lend money to you, I know you're a risky company, but you gave your safest asset to back my loan. So what I'm trying to say is when you look at an individual board, what you might be getting might not reflect the overall. That's why ratings agencies attach two ratings. They attach one to the entire company and one to a bond. For many, for many cases, the two would be the same, but check to see if they're the same. So the easy scenario is if you have a rating for your company. If you're a big US company, big European company, even big Asian companies, you now have ratings, you can use them. But about two thirds of all publicly traded companies in the world have no rating. So I want to talk about how to estimate the cost of debt for those companies. And I'm going to essentially play the role of a ratings agency. I mean, ratings agencies are the most transparent organizations in the world. Not because they reveal everything, but because of what their output is. What do S&P and Moody's tell you every year? They give you the rating for every company they rate, right? The public domain. And then they give away the game. If you go to the S&P website, they tell you the seven ratios, the eight ratios they look at to make come up with that rating. EBITDA to fixed charges, EBIT to interest expense, debt to capital. So when I first decided to play the role of a rating agency, that's what I started with. I took the ratings of every rated company. I took these eight ratios they told me they used, and then I did some reverse engineering. You don't remember reverse engineering? I sorted the companies based on rating from AAA to D to see if there was some pattern I could find in the ratios. And I very quickly discovered that for non-financial service companies, one ratio was doing the bulk of the work and the rest were along for the ride. The one ratio that seemed to be driving the rating was the interest coverage ratio. So what I'm gonna do for companies that don't have a rating is I'm gonna use the interest coverage ratio for these companies and I'll go through the calculation and use it to come up with the rating they would have if the rating agency had rated them. So let me start with my easy companies. And then next session we start, we do the synthetic ratings for all these companies. For my three companies which had ratings, and I had S&P ratings, I just used the default spread based on the rating. Came up with the cost of debt for each of these companies. So at the time that I did this, Disney and Deutsche had single A ratings, while it was A minus rated, cost of debt in US dollar terms for Disney and for Vale. And for you in Euro terms for Deutsche is right there, risk-free rate plus default spread. If I wanted to get Bali's cost of debt in dollars, you know the trick already, right? There's my dollar cost of debt. You add the extra inflation on, I can get a nominal REI cost of debt just like I did a cost of equity. So next session when we start, we're gonna start with synthetic ratings. Look at what ratings we would attach to the companies that weren't rated. And also what ratings we'd come up with for these companies that actually have a rating. So I'll see you on Wednesday.